All right, um, so welcome to NS Meetup December. A quick round of applause. Yay. How many uh, first timers do we have here tonight? Raise your hands high. We're gonna make you dance around the room. No, we're not. Okay, welcome everybody, first timers. Quick round of applause for the newbies. Uh, this is our 26th NS Meetup. We meet on the first Wednesday of every month. We do some tech talks, have a little Q&A, and then do some networking and drinks. Uh, if you guys haven't been to Eventbrite before, the most important thing is the beer is right there. Um, also, the recycling bins just next to it. Please clean up after yourself so I don't have to clean up after you. Uh, the bathrooms are on the opposite side of where we're standing right now. This is a square layout, just go around the hall. Bathrooms are on the other side. Um, without anything else, let's introduce Alex and Tom from Instagram. Thanks. Thomas from Instagram, that's Alex over there. It's gonna be a split talk, so you'll hear more from him later. Um, I'm actually on the data team at Instagram, so normally I do back-end work, but of course I'm not here to talk to you about back-end work. And I'm here to talk to you about hip labs. Right, that was my like big slide there. I was excited about it. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna cover is the story of hyperlapse. It actually had a, it's probably not that unusual of a story, but it's an unusual story to be told externally. Um, because it was not a project that was really like planned by anybody. It was really just something uh, we hacked together and thought it was so cool that there would be a shame not to release it. So before we do that, let's see here. We got good. So this is the team. <laughs> There's three of us. Uh, this is me on the uh, your left, I guess. Chris Connolly is our designer. Unfortunately, not here with us today. Alex on the right. And that was it, really. Um, anyone who wrote any code was the two of us. Uh, Chris's designs were the only designs that actually worked with the hyperlapse. And so that was the exclusively entire team. We got some help, um, obviously, do the launch work from Instagram. Uh, we got some help with uh, even product management. But that was, a, that was a core of it, which is quite unusual for us. So our journey here, Alex and myself, didn't actually start with Instagram. We didn't start on Facebook. Um, this was how we got introduced to it. Um, we were part of a startup called Luma which did uh, camera stabilization. It was a YC startup, I forget the batch. 20, Winter 12. 12, okay, Winter 2012. Um, and we were acquired right around the time that Instagram was doing video. You may or may not know this, but in Instagram's video product, there's an extremely advanced stabilization technology hidden in there. If you happen to capture video with Instagram, it's probably the smoothest video you've ever seen. But most people don't capture video with Instagram. I'll tell this story in about three parts, and there's three parts that are apps. So the first app I'm going to talk to you about is called Luma Labs, and it was the app that we put together just to see if this technology would work. So basically, oh, there we go. Okay, uh, I was feeling a little bit left out. I had actually worked about negative two days at Luma before they were acquired, uh, <laughs> so. I was feeling a little bit left out of the stabilization technology. That's why I signed on. I was like, I really want to work with this stuff and see what it's all about. Um, I've always loved time-lapse films. You know, Baraka comes to mind. There's a few others. Um, but I was way too lazy to make them, obviously. I think most people in the world are way too lazy. But the nice thing about being a programmer is that um, you know, a programmer with access to extremely advanced stabilization technology <laughs> is that you can actually try these things out. It's like, I, I was too lazy, but maybe if I prototype some product, I can see if the stabilization technology will actually connect to time-lapse uh, films. And uh, so we put together a little app, I think it was in about two weeks, that just like hacked it, in, I'll show you the interface in a minute, the dirtiest interface you've ever seen, and hacked this uh, stabilization technology. Um, and then I shot this, so Stanford campus. Um, this is about, I think a week into it, and it was one of the first shots that I ever did on um, a bike. And as soon as I saw this, I was like, this has never been done before. You know, nobody has ever been able to be on a bike and use like a time lapse. It's kind of a, a joke. Alex will explain later about why that's impossible. But I saw this and I was like, we have to ship this. Like, it's, it's actually ridiculous not to ship this. And this was in July of 2013. So it was about a year and a month before we actually released it. Uh, this is the interface. And I would encourage you, if you ever have an idea like this, um, don't 
go all out, like don't make a good interface, just pack it into whatever sh way, shape, or form you can. This is the old Luma interface right here, and basically the only thing I added was this time lapse factor here, so you could press plus or minus, and you did that before you recorded, uh, and it just dropped frames. It dropped frames and then it used Alex's, oh, lied about the timestamp, and so Alex's advanced stabilization just kind of naturally So, like I said, it was never intended to be a release product. Uh, we pitched it as an idea in an Instagram pitchathon, which is something we've done exactly one of. Um, but fortunately, this came, this came out of it. Um, and we just worked on it as a side project. It was never our full time job, so I'm not even on the iOS program team. And it was just like something that we wanted to work on in our spare time. Um, so then came Cinema. Cinema was like an actual Instagram effort to, to make us a dedicated app. Um, this is what cinema looks like. It's not, it's not make it let's put it that way. Um, you could record, kind of, you can see the sort of design evolving here. Uh, you were, could record, it would go immediately to your library, um, which is actually something we cut from iPhone apps because we didn't want a library, it's too complicated. And the only control you had was this new toggle down here. And so you could go from 5x, and you pressed it, you go to 6x, you pressed it, you go to 7x. And so you could actually make the decision about how fast you wanted your time lapse to be after you record. So the idea was you just keep recording, and if you said like, well, oh, that was a good video, a fact it was not even a good time lapse, I'm gonna make it one X, you could do that. Um, I think, I, I went over to Chicago in March of this year, and um, you know, the project actually hadn't really been picked up internally, we were just kind of, it was still very much a side project. Uh, and I was just remembering, I, I took a train out there, um, which is you know, two days, and it's a very beautiful journey if you ever had an opportunity do it. Um, and the whole time I was thinking like how much, how cool would the shots be if I could have just like shown this externally, if I could have just taken these, these beautiful time lapse shots and shown them to the world because I just wanted to share them. So I spent the, um, most of the trip in my hotel room hacking together um, the first iteration of I guess what became Hyperlapse. It was really just hacking in the time lapse factors into cinema. Um, and once I saw this I was like okay like we doubly have to ship this. Like, there's, there's just no question to me. How, how could we possibly not have this? I'm the only person in the entire world that has this technology in our pocket, and it's ridiculous that if, if we can't put this externally. Um, so as we kind of get towards a product, what I did is we engaged Chris Connolly as a designer. Um, obviously, before that, you could see it was a very programmer UI, um, which is the right thing to do, but if you want to pitch this to, as an actual product, especially with the Instagram brand name on it, uh, it has to be published. We simplified the app. It was like way too complicated. There was a library. It was like uh, you know you had to use this weird toggly thing, and like um, we simplified it to be exactly three screens. And in fact, I was totally terrified when we were doing this process because Chris Connolly was cutting features from Hyperlapse, or like what I had as Hyperlapse, and I was like, we can't cut that, right? We can't cut the library. What if it crashes? You know, like we can't cut that. Like it's too simple. Like there's only three screens. It's ridiculous. Um, this is kind of what we ended up with. This is the first iteration of Hyperlapse. Um, you'll see some of the design elements. You know, the circle is cleaned up a little bit, but it's obviously very far off from the uh, logo. This is the build we distributed internally. Um, the main difference between this and Cinema, uh, when you press next, oh yeah, sorry, up here, uh, is this toggle. Uh, it's still a toggle. It's not that slider that you see in the uh, in the final app, but. Um, you could share to Facebook, you couldn't even share to Instagram. Like that's how basic we were. But we just wanted to get this, we wanted to get momentum internally, people sharing inside so that you know we could see that this was actually a product. And so that's Hyperlapse. We implemented these designs, we distributed them amongst the company. And I think the biggest thing, Anna sitting in the corner there, uh, she we were on a, a Tahoe trip and she's like, man, I really just want to share my hyperlapses. So we created a Facebook group to share your hyperlapses, and it was like the most active internal group I've ever seen in my entire life. We would get like 10 to 20 hyperlapses a day. And when you think about that, it's like we're asking people to hold up their phone and keep recording for like 60 seconds or 120 seconds. It's a really big ask of a person. And so the fact that people were posting 20 of them a day internally was like a very positive sign. It was a very difficult sign or a difficult thing to say no to. And so after we finally we talked to Kevin, and Kevin was like, OK, check. Like, it's time to ship. Uh, and we spent about a month hammering in, and it was a pretty intense month, hammering into Hyperlapse, which was actually released externally. 
This is what you see in the App Store. Um, this is where the slider got introduced. Alex is going to go into some of the technical details of that slider. You know, I'm just trying to give you a product overview. Um, part of Hyperlapse is like it's an extremely technical product that's made extremely simple by this UI, and it hides some of the complexity, which is the right thing to do. But you wouldn't believe the amount of engineering work that's in that little slider to move it from 12 next to nine. So Alex will talk about this science. <laughs> <laughs> Engineers. Best. All right. So as Tom said, I'll talk to you about the science. Essentially, my goal will be to explain how we go from this to this. Uh, essentially, how you take a shaky video that you typically record on your mobile phone and turn it into a hyperlapse. Uh, and feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. That's a good one. Um, and so like, to start, I'll actually give you a quick crash course on video stabilization. Um, there are a number of ways you can do video stabilization. The one you're most familiar with, most likely, um, although you might not know it, is uh, mechanical stabilization, which looks like this. Uh, it's essentially a, a movie operator wearing a harness to which you attach a film camera. And the point of this harness is to separate the motion of the operator from the motion of the camera. So, so that, for example, if the operator is running, the camera is kind of floating next to it. Um, and like one of the first uses of the Steadicam was actually in Rocky in 1976. Um, so if you actually go back and watch movies before 1976 and after, um, you'll see that it's transformed the movie industry a lot. Nowadays, it's basically impossible to watch a movie that doesn't use a Steadicam. Um, so it's, it's had a huge impact on, video stabilization has, has had a huge impact on the movie industry. And we want to do the same for consumer devices. Of course, this is not what we want to ship, right? Like, imagine <laughs> Instagram ships steady can. Uh, so that's not um, the way to go. Um, an alternative that you might have heard of um, is optical stabilization. Um, so this is what's in the iPhone 6 Plus. But um, the problem with optical stabilization is, or well, so the way optical stabilization works is it's actually very similar to mechanical stabilization, um, except instead of stabilizing the entire camera, you stabilize the lens and the optics inside the camera. So actually, the, it still moves mechanically, but just like within the enclosure of, of the camera body. Um, but of course, um, sm uh, um, smartphones are small, so there's not a lot of room for, for that motion. So it, in practice, this doesn't work well for video. Um, and this is actually why the iPhone um, 6 Plus does optical image stabilization only on still photography. Um, so what, what we're left with is digital stabilization, and that's the route we take. So essentially, we record a shaky video, and then after the fact, we do some math to figure out how to correct um, the picture to remove the shake. Um, and in our case, we actually do that by using the gyroscope in the camera. So as you record the video, we measure the motion of the camera using the gyroscope. Um, so that's the approach we're going to take. That's the gyroscope in, in your phone, iPhone. Um, and so essentially, the way this starts is you hit record and we capture a bunch of gyro samples. Uh, we capture a bunch of frames and then we take those and feed, feed them through this class called the IG Track Stabilizer. It's essentially a class that takes the gyro samples and integrates them to obtain the camera rotation. Um, and it takes the frames and computes a new set. So it, it takes the camera rotation and smooths those rotations out. Um, so essentially removing all those like kinks and bumps from your handshake. Uh, and so then the goal becomes um, to take those orientations and take those shaky frames and put them through an, uh, a filter, essentially. And the filter um, we call IG stabilization filter, which um, is implemented on top of the GPU, the GPU um, which takes those frames and those orientations and outputs new steady frames. So to actually illustrate what this looks like is, um, this is a stabilized video, but if we zoom out, this is what we're doing, essentially. Um, so what you actually get in the output video is inside this dotted line. Um, and the, the shaky frame that you see on the outside, that's the original video and, and the handshake. So what, what we've done here essentially is we've taken your shaky recording, measured the camera motion, smoothed out that camera motion, and mapped those frames from the shaky recording onto this new smooth camera motion. One thing you should note is um, you can see there's a bl black region outside of um, the frame. So what we do is we ensure that th those black regions never appear inside this um, rectangle. Um, so that will become important later. But essentially, we, we zoom in or we crop to give ourselves some room to counteract uh, handshake. 
So, well, how does this apply to uh, time lapses? So, what you could do is um, you could take your video um, and select every nth frame, let's say every third frame, and then you play those frames back at 30 fps. So that's that's how you, you do time lapse. Except if you do this naively for for the video I just showed you, this is what you get. It's pretty good, but it's a lot more shaky than the original video. Um, and the insight here is that well, we actually apply those black region constraints. Um, so, so like. We've ensured that frames we've dropped don't appear, like um, affect the result of this video, right? Um, so what we could do instead is only run the stabilizer on the frames that we keep. So it's, instead of doing stabilization on the video and then speeding it up, we first drop the frames we're not going to display, and then we're going to compute the stabilization and the force the constraint that ensures that no black regions appear um, on the frames that we're going to display. So this this means that. Um, when you go from playing, playing back 1x to 2x, we actually run the stabilization again. Um, and if we do this, this is what we get as output. So it's a lot more smooth. And th this is what hyperlapse produces. So now the trick here is to make this look effortless, right? <laughs> we have a scrubber in the app that you scrub like from 1x to 8x, and the video keeps playing. But stabilization actually takes time. So we don't have stabilization results as you do this. Um, so, we, so we need to do something, right? Um, and the way we do this is by cheating. Um, so, so just to illustrate the video here. So this is the interface. And as you scrub, like going from 6x to 1x, the video slows down or speeds up, and we compute new um, substitution results. And the video, as you can see, keeps playing. There's no interruptions in the um, So I'll talk about how we did this. All right, so, so let's say we start at 1x, we've computed the orientations, um, and now let's say you go from 1x to 2x. So what we do is we're going to display those yellow frames, um, but we don't have orientations at 2x yet. So what, what we're going to do is we're going to take the orientations we've computed at 1x, and meanwhile, in the background, we're going to kick off a stabilization path that is going to compute a new stabilization, like new stabilized orientations at this new um, playback speed, which is 2x. And so once those come in, then we swap out the two. And then, and then we play at 2x. Um, so this is going from 1x to 2x. What about going in the opposite direction? So if, if you go back to 1x, then we kind of do the same thing, except in this case, what do we do for, for this frame? Um, and the answer is, the short answer is, we interpolate, and we interpolate spherically because it's, we're, we're dealing with rotations. It's a lot of math, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, so how do we change, uh, so this, this is how we do stabilization um, without stalling the UI. Um, so it actually turned out to be really hard to speed up the video and slow it down using AP Foundation. So, so the, um, the frameworks we have in iOS to play video. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through some of the things we tried to build this. Because the goal was to build a slider. We really felt that like this would sell um, this like notion of like experimentation, like you should be able to scrub back and forth. You shouldn't have to like wait, and like the UI shouldn't stop. Um, you should be able to experiment with different times, time and months, and it should appear effortless. Um, so we put in a lot of effort and explored a lot of different APIs to try to make this work. Um, so the first thing we tried was AV player um, set rate. Um, so this is uh, for those of you familiar with AV Foundation. This is how you play a back a video, and on the player you can set the playback rate. The only problem is it goes up to 2x and we wanted to go up to 8x, so that didn't work. We went on to the next um, option, which is AV Compositions. Um, this is what's used in slow-mo video. Um, AV Compositions ca can stretch time or compress it. Um, so, so in a slow-mo video, you, you would stretch it, and then in our case, we were trying to compress it. Um, this actually worked, I think, up to 8x. The only issue is Every time you change the time lapse amount, we actually have to create a new AV composition, insert the track into the composition, and set that on the player. And so that ended up slowing the UI. So you wouldn't be able to seamlessly um, scrub, and that was really important for us. So we went lower level. Uh, we tried um, something called AV asset feeder, um, and that is essentially a way to decode frames um, and, and hand them to you. The only problem is the decoded frames, you can't get fast enough. You can get encoded frames from, from this um, class, but there was no way to decode them, at least in iOS 7. So that also didn't work. And actually, this is pretty much the extent of the AV Foundation APIs that you would think to use. <laughs> Except there's one other class uh, <laughs> called AV Asset Image Generator, 
And for those of you familiar with the foundation framework, uh, this would be really surprising. Um, because this class is actually not meant for video playback. It's meant to generate those thumbnails on the tracks. Um, so like if you use iMovie or Instagram, um, this is what people use it for. People don't use it for video playback. Uh, but it actually turns out you can ask it to give you full resolution frames. And not only can it do that at 30 FPS, it turns out that if you look at the do documentation of AV Asset Image Generator in this, this function, um, it has this interesting line in it which says, employs an efficient batch mode for getting images in time order. It actually turns out this is the only class um, in AV Foundation that allows you to get, uh, to seek the frames without decoding every frame. So that means you can actually play back the video, essentially at any rate, because this class will seek um, jump in the, in the video file to give you frames back at 30 FPS at any time of amount you want. So that is the trick that made this work. This is, this is what made this, that slider work. Up until that point, we would have stuck with that toggle um, that Thomas was showing you before. So one other thing I want to talk about is uh, one of the benefits of um, applying stabilization digitally is we actually have the entire video recording. Um, and as I said, as you scrub um, the time amount, we can compute a new stabilization factor. One other thing in addition to that is we can actually look at the video that we recorded and decide how much we need to zoom in. So in the video on the left, where I'm standing still, there's not a lot of shake in the video, so we don't actually need to zoom in, zoom in a lot. We don't need a lot of room to count around the handshake. Um, so we don't zoom in a lot. And in the video on the right, where I, I'm walking, it's a lot more shaky. Um, to produce a stable video, it's better to zoom in, zoom in more. Um, so zooming in trades off um, resolution for stability. Um, and we can do this intelligently based on the type of video that you've recorded. So to recap, um, this is what happens when you describe that slider, uh, which people do a lot. Uh, one, we kick off stabilization in the background. Um, we compute the optimal zoom, as I've just showed you. Um, we compute the new orientations while we interpolate using the old orientations. And we cancel ima the image asset generator and request frames at a new set of times, at the new time lapse amount. And so we do all of that while we keep the UI responsive. So the goal is to never stall the UI. <coughs> and that's, that's Hyperlapse. Say you have a pretty shaky video, um, but at one point in the video, just like for maybe half a second, you like dip down a little bit, mm -hmm. and it's uh, extremely shaky at only that half a second. What do you do with that? Um, I, so I never understood. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have code that essentially you look at the 90th percentile of your motion. So, so like if, if let's say you just set up down on a tripod and we'll shake it just at the beginning or just at the end or somewhere in the middle, then we will ignore that. We will compute the zoom based on 90% um, of the video, the shake in like the 90% of the video. So, so like not the extreme end. Okay. Okay. But wouldn't that add black like uh, outside the frame? No, it will be shaky at the Oh, it'll sh okay, it just won't do anything. Mm -hmm. okay. there's, there's also an effect um, that you may either be referring to indirectly or something where if you keep it somewhat still, you actually do see some motion that was not present in your hand. And that's um, due to gyro, gyro drift. So because we're integrating samples, there's a drift over time, and we actually have some motion that we need to, uh, that is present in the gyroscope that's actually not present in your hand. It's something we have to correct for. We have some code for that. Is it always mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you were doing uh, Spherical interpolation across the orientation. Is that when you're working in quaternions or what do you Yes. Okay. <laughs> For the people who don't know what that is, that's how you interpolate locations smoothly. So when you correct a frame, is it sufficient just to translate or from the gyro are you getting an angle and then applying more complex uh, transformation? Um, it's more complex. The camera has a rolling shutter. So it's actually, the camera in, in your mobile phone works like a scanner. It actually reads out the image row by row. Um, and as it does that, your phone is actually moving. So your frame um, is warped. So we, we correct, correct for that. 
Um, so one thing that I haven't talked about here, but which is um, an important step, is um, figuring out the rolling shutter speed of the camera, the focal length of the camera, essentially having a very accurate model of the camera to allow you to correct for those effects. Is the measurement you get from the gyroscope enough to calculate all the transforms, or do you also need to do a little digital correlation to you know, do the fine adjustment? Uh, it's all the gyro. We, do, we don't use image features at all except to calibrate the camera, which is done offline. It's, uh, it's not actually, like we essentially pre-calibrate pre -calibrate the devices. And one, once that's done, it's all the gyro. Right, okay, thanks. What do you mean you're recalibrating the device? How are you doing uh, so essentially, each each iPhone device. Okay, so what happens when iPhone releases a phone is I go buy the phone, uh, <laughs> then I record the video, and then we do some image tracking, feature tracking that correlates the features to the um, gyroscope samples. It's usually a frantic dash. You know, for the iPhone six and six plus. Like we're a little, a little bit nervous about the six plus just because it had optical stabilization and we didn't know what what would happen. <laughs> uh, so at the last minute we put in some code to deliver dynamic calibrations. If in the rare case you um, you download the app and we didn't have a calibration baked in, um, it would go to our servers and download a new calibration. So on the first day we <laughs> bought the phones. Actually Alex was in Europe or something and I, I like ran around Facebook, found people that had the iPhone 6 Plus because it was so hard to get and then walked outside and like shook it around a lot. And then, uh, yeah, and then we <laughs> wrote this file, we're like, I don't know if it's gonna work, we're like maybe 90% sure it's gonna work, and sure enough it did, so on the first day people could actually use uh, use their sick pluses to, to record video. And we're very relieved that the optical stabilization didn't screw with us, I guess. Did you try using motion vectors as well, or just the, the gyroscope? Uh, we only use the gyroscope. It's actually really accurate. You'd be surprised how far you can get without um, one of the advantages is if, if you do any kind of image um, processing, it's CPU intensive, so it's going to drain the battery more. So you'd like to avoid that as much as you can, and we do. Except for the drift, I guess. Except for the drift, yes. <coughs> so you mentioned um, processing on the GPU, I think, for the correction. Could, could you just explain what you, how you use the GPU and which computations were um, better done on the GPU? Right, so that, that frame that I showed you how it's moving, that, is, that, that transformation, the warping of the frame is computed on the GPU. So it, essentially a way to, you can think about this is the, the frame is a quad that's subdivided um, and then each vertex of, the, of that subdivision is transformed um, according to, um, to essentially um, reorient the frame to, to, towards this new smooth orientation, um, and so and so 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 it's essentially the setup is a like typical OpenGL setup. You have a texture which is the frame, and you have a mesh which is like a bunch of vertices, and then the, G, the GPU is very efficient at computing that. And that's what I was asking: was it OpenGL that you used directly, or one of the other frameworks? OpenGL, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so you mentioned all the trial and error for getting the slider to work properly. Um, what kind of discussions were there internally about how much time that's worth doing for the design <laughs> and, so and who was against you and who was for you? I, think I was against Alex. Alex was really I, adamant I about kept this. pushing for the slider <laughs> because, like, I, as I said, I think it's really important to encourage the experimentation. It's really important to hide the complexity that happens. Like, to the user, this should look like, when, when they open the app and they drag the slider and they see the result, I mean, it should be, of course, it works that way, right? Like, how else should it work? Um, and so, I mean, that's where this came from. And then, like, trying to figure this out took, I think I spent about three weeks just, like, trying all of those. I actually didn't cover all the things I tried. Like, it went, like, really, really like, crazy time. <laughs> um, but, like, it's actually, the solution ended up being quite unconventional. Um, um, all right, so, uh, if you're using the gyroscope data, it makes sense that you can't import a video because it's missing that data, so you can't stabilize it with your algorithm. Uh, but it would be awesome if you could stabilize video with your algorithm. So I was wondering if you guys have experimented with that and how close you're able to get. If you have, I guess you probably can't. 
come out of future plans, but <laughs> any research in, in, in that area is, is interesting. I think it would be very difficult to pull off hyperlapse without, um, without the gyroscope data, specifically, just because of the, the way like um, traditional vision-based stabilization works. It's not really designed to install it. So if, if, if you're familiar with like Final Cut or iMovie, um, they have image-based stabilization, so you can import the video and then like tell it to stabilize it. Uh, what happens is when you press that button, you go grab coffee because it will take you like 15 minutes to process like five minutes of video. Um, and imagine that on a mobile device. Um, so it's it, it's the challenge is making this like fast. You know, like consumers don't like generally people don't want to wait; they want to see the result instantly. Um, and for those who, who want to go the advanced route, I mean, there, there are more advanced tools. So you said that the um, iPhone 6 plus image stabilization didn't make any difference. Was that because it makes it over, makes, uh, stabilizes the image in such a small, uh, range or so I mean, it's actually <laughs> off yeah. for, for video recording. So the iPhone 6 Plus only <laughs> uses image op optical stabilization for still photography. So, so, so when um, the reason you want to do this for still photography is, um, you, let's say you're in low light um, and you do a longer exposure, um, that's typically when you get that blurry picture. If you don't have optical stabilization, but with optical stabilization, you can actually have the shutter all open for longer because they'll counteract the motion, like natural motion of your hands. Um, but the amount they can count counteract your motion is not very, very large. So for video, it's not gonna do, like make a big difference. Um, and so they don't use optical stabilization; they, they turn it off. Hey, thanks. Um, I love hyperlapse as well. Um, and then I try and share it to Facebook, and it's always really low resolution. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's 100% the Facebook video encoder. Uh, it's, it's like, I guess the, the, the answer is that we shouldn't really blame the encoder here because of the way hyperlapse videos, like, there's a lot of motion in them. So implicitly, it's going to be a much worse, um, it's going to be a much more difficult job for the encoder to do. Like it just wasn't designed to work with this type of video. It's, it's usually for like something that doesn't have such a wide range of motion, so it can compress it better, less delta or less difference between frames. Um, there is a secret way. Let's see. There are there's different ways to share it to Facebook. Um, if you share it in the app, there's an option to to press HD. Um, you can only do that in iOS 8.1 and higher, I believe, because 8.0 had a bug in it where you, they disabled the video sharing for Facebook. Um, if you share it through the app, you actually can go through settings and there's a way to upload HD. And generally if you upload, like settings, I mean, like setting the Apple settings and then Facebook and then like it's really buried in there. Um, generally that will do an okay job. But it's just a harder job for the encoder and it's just not what's designed. And Instagram kind of has the same problem. And then there's this, also this double encoding problem. If you share it to Instagram, um, it then shares it to Facebook and so you get dinged twice by the two encoders who are both doing a, like a questionable job with this type of video, so, yeah. So to add a bit, um, so for context, we use the native share dialog to share to Facebook. Um, and I think it defaults to medium code, so that it will actually take the video we output, transcode it, and then upload it to Facebook, and then Facebook will transcode it. Okay. Um, and so you get, with a, get the result is a suboptimal <laughs> looking video. Um, so you can change it to HD, HD but that um, is quite cumbersome. Um, yeah, but that's it, kind of it's there. You just have to, it's yeah. like a button you press. But you have to make sure you're on 8.1 and higher. It's probably, at 8.0 we had this weird, there's just like so it's many one, It's one of the things, um, <laughs> like the goal is to keep this simple and not try to build like a full like, sharing experience. So we just used the mobile chair. Yeah. We were very opposed to having you log in in the app. So there was a Microsoft research paper that I think came out around the time that you guys released Hyperlapse that I think also used the word Hyperlapse. Yeah. Uh, was, this, was it like before? Did you guys read it? It was, it was the strangest coincidence yeah. of all time. Um, I don't know if anyone will believe me if I tell them that, but it's true. Uh, we kind of like, 
we came in that day. We were like, obviously, this, these type of products take a long time. I mean, it, it did take us like a year to actually get this out. At that point, when the Microsoft paper came out, we were we had a launch day. We were ready to go. Um, but it was just like a day of trying to answer questions as to why, like, are we collaborating with Microsoft? And everybody in Facebook was like, well, are we? What's going on? <laughs> it was like, no, you know, hyperlapse is an industry term. Um, maybe not be an especially well-known one, at least before this app. But it's an industry term, just means time lapse is captured with camera motion. So actually, the screenshots you showed about hack, hack the, the first iteration of hyperlapse, um, where it actually said hyperlapse, those were before the Microsoft paper. Um, I mean, but, yeah. but yeah, it's just like, it was the weirdest day. You come in and there's like articles in hyperlapse, and we're like, what? I think in the end, it was actually good for us, because it was like, oh, we have this amazing technology you can't have. Wait, wait, <laughs> wait two weeks and we got you. Are you guys considering using any of the stuff in the paper like to improve this? So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we get this question quite a bit. Um, Microsoft approach is very different. Um, it's a research paper. It's um, a really cool, like, very cool algorithm, really cool work. Um, one, one of the things you have to keep in mind is um, it takes them, I think, 300 CPU hours to compute five minutes of video um, on a like brief workstation. We're not talking mobile phones here, um, so so their approach is very different, right? That, that's, it's essentially like comparing apples to oranges. It's like this really cool like algorithmic research paper, and like this is a consumer app that like, runs on a mobile phone. Right? Okay. On CNN, I found out a uh, news to show that how to turn on the have a lapse hide and setting by <laughs> the I don't know. I tried it so many times, but I can't turn it on. Should we reveal the secret just here? Oh. I mean, <laughs> it's, it leaked. Okay, yeah. so, so what, what, what um, you're talking about is there is a secret menu now. When I mentioned that we can go like the AV asset generator allows us to go like to pretty much any time lapse amount even though this, the slide is, is capped at 8x um, there is a secret menu that allows you to go up to 40x um, <laughs> so the way you access it I guess like yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's a quad tap with four fingers four fingers <laughs> four times <laughs> <two>. <laughs> it's like exceptionally difficult to pull off um, it's like riding a bicycle you never get it the first time but like eventually once you get it you get it every single time um, there's 1080p in there there's a few other things we originally um, that was just in internal testing uh, originally, the menu actually had sound levels because we were working with the sound guys to like set the decibel the right level and stuff. So it was really just because we like wanted to have this internally. We wanted to play around with these different things that we could actually like, <coughs> potentially put in the app. Um, then we kind of left it in as an Easter egg, and then you know, like what is it, a month and a half, somebody found it. it was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, we cleaned it up in the latest release, so if you, you actually tap it, it looks better. It doesn't look like it's some <laughs> weird dev crazy setting, uh, but mo most of it's still there. The reason we didn't ship the 40X and the 24X support um, is that the gyro drift is much more noticeable there. Um, it's something we could potentially correct for, but we didn't have any guarantee time to do it. So do you have to scan through the entire video to determine the zoom level? And does the zoom level stay the same throughout the video? And do you have a maximum zoom level that you'll allow? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, we scan through the entire video. Um, it's actually, that's the fact, that doesn't take a long time. The stabilization, like enforcing the black region contains, like that, that's the bulk of the time. Um, and your other question, yes, there's a maximum on zoom. It's, uh, I think it's 25, um, so 1.25 times zoom, that's the maximum. So we'll, we'll have it at that point. Hey, um, so it's been a while since I did any like the video processing stuff on the iOS devices. This is like back when the 4S first came out. But I remember like when I was doing the, the transforms I was doing, I remember seeing really significant differences in what you get away with in like the 4S versus the 4. Do you notice in the current generation of devices like any significant differences in the capabilities of like how much like this, the processing power, how far you can push it? Um, yeah, the GPU has improved a lot. It's actually one of the main th like main improvements as you upgrade iPhones is the GPU speed. The CPU is kind of like 
flattened out, the GPUs are still going uh, up quite rapidly, uh, which is really exciting because you, you can do a lot more than we do currently on your phones. Um, Hyperlabs with four S and plus is what you support, I think. No, we no support four. four. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You're right. Yeah, that's four was a challenge. Let's put it that way. I mean, it, it's yeah, a yeah. slightly reduced experience on the four. The four is like an exceptionally difficult device to support for most apps in general. Um, and so what we got away with is there's like some sneaky stuff we did. The asset image generator that Alex was talking about is like half resolution on some of the worst devices. And it also is capped, I think, at about 10 minutes of report time. That wasn't really scientifically generated. We were just like, oh man, I don't think we can go up to 45 minutes on those devices. But otherwise it works. I mean, it, it actually works. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, I'll wait for asking that. Android? We can comment on the You guys mentioned this was a side project, and you, um, uh, Thomas, you're not actually even on the iOS team, but um, now that Hyperlapse is out, how long, how much time do you guys spend on it? Are you guys working actively on it, or is it still just a side project? And I guess the right way to say it is that we are happy with the product. It's one of the few products that we've shipped where it's like, this product is almost done. Like, <laughs> you know, we could add stuff and it might actually distract from the experience. Um, We've made some updates to it. We added some selfie support. There were some things that we thought were missing from it. And we'll probably continue to do that. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say I work. I mean, we released it this week. We released a little bug fix update. But um, it's more or less what we what we choose to put in there. Yeah. Thanks. Great, great. We'll put a round of applause for Dominic.